Well, hello everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is David Leclerc. I uh, might know me as the guy that does not say a thing during the Chug webinars and just sit there and smile. Uh, this is the very first of our Chug chat. Uh, I called it, it's a working title, but the, the title right now is uh, Chatting Around the Dumpster Fire. Uh, so we'll see where that takes us. Uh, with me are Pat Sims, who is manager of the core, direct, uh, the core facility in Flow Sanctuary at the University of, Lo University of Loyola. Uh, uh, Laura Johnson is the associate scientific director at the University of Chicago core facility uh, in Flow Sanctuary. And uh, uh, Ryan Duggan is, the, uh, is a senior scientist uh, at ADVI. Um, so I'd like to take a very few minutes to, to uh, just have you uh, tell the audience uh, who you are, what you are, what your interests are in the, in this field. Talk with Pat. Well, I'm Pat Sims, and I've uh, been doing flow cytometry an awfully long time. I started off doing some little immunological assays, and then we needed to look at flow. And the instruments that I started on were capable of three colors and I thought it was hot stuff. And it's been such a joy to be able to grow with the science and grow with the immunology. And when you look back on where I started now, it's, it's, like, it's like we're on Star Trek or something like that. So it's very exciting now. And now we're be able to do more to help all of our people, both at our universities and throughout to kind of bring them up to speed on all the things that we can do with the flow cytometry. And so I'm very excited about being part of this uh, chug chat. Laura. Uh, I have been doing flow cytometry for, let's see, I think about 10 years. Um, and I started doing it when I was a technician. And then I went to grad school at Northwestern to get my PhD. Uh, I was in the division of allergy immunology. So technically, I studied allergy, although my Thesis didn't really end up being on allergic disease, <laughs> um, kind of adjacent to allergic disease. Um, but after I got my PhD, then I ended up in this position at the University of Chicago, where I get to help researchers with their experiment um, and help them learn how to do flow cytometry and um, troubleshoot their data and um, any sort of scientific assistance that people need regarding their flow cytometry experiments. That's what I do. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> Ryan. Yes, thank you. Uh, like David mentioned, I'm a senior scientist at Abbey in North Chicago. And there I work in the immune oncology group. It's a uh, part of the early discovery oncology group at AbbVie where we're on the very, very front end of drug development. So it's mostly about finding new targets, target validation, and then carrying those through to uh, later discovery and uh, mostly preclinical stuff though. So in, in that capacity, it's much like working at many of the academic labs um, where it's focused on basic biology. Um, I specifically work in the technology area, so flow cytometry, uh, some imaging, and now a little bit more in the genomics arena. And uh, one of my passions is really kind of tying all those things together especially the data end of it and looking at ways to make correlations ac across the different technologies to give us the, the fullest picture of what's going on uh, in the biology. And uh, uh, also thanks for having me here. Always <laughs> a pleasure to chat with you all. You're welcome. <laughs> so you, so as at the time we're recording this, we're on uh, June 23rd and, and University of Chicago, for example, we're just now reopening our research activities. Uh, how has the, the disease, the COVID-19 situation affected your, uh, your, your, uh, your work at that V? Yeah, I think um, 
Well, I mean, I think Abby in general is considered a, an essential uh, business. So we don't, we aren't necessarily mandated or um, phased in according to kind of the government uh, mandates, but we've, we've been phasing in just like everybody else. Um, I think in my group, there are three of us who make up the flow team in the IO group. And we kind of alternate days of the week, uh, probably not having more than two people there at a time. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's lots of mouse studies that are ongoing that still need attention as more and more people are, are phasing back into work. The needs for sorting and the needs for, you know, just general assistance on the analyzers, uh, helping people build panels, making antibody cocktails, things like that, that just becomes uh, more and more needed. So I'd say at this point, um, we're at about 50% back to work. We've uh, gone through the various labs according to square footage and determine what would be a, a maximum number of people that we'd want to have in, in those spaces. And that has worked out pretty well. I think everybody is, is on board and is um, aware of the precautions that need to be uh, taken. And they have really, you know, kind of embraced uh, the situation that is at hand and uh, kind of just rolled with the punches and, and done as much as we can from home when possible. You know, I've, I've been doing a lot more analysis via uh, remote desktop because I have a, a nice powerful workstation at work and just my laptop at home. So that's been uh, surprisingly useful to be able to do um, some big analyses while still you know, from the comfort of my own home and uh, tap into the power of a, a hefty workstation. That's lucky. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. The situation been about the same at Toyota? Well, um, <clears throat> I'm, the, I'm the whole facility right now at Loyola right. since I lost my technician and we have a hiring freeze, so I don't know what's going to happen with that. Yikes. But I've had to, I've been going in the whole time on a infrequent basis once or twice a week until we entered phase one because we, we actually have a couple of coronavirus guys who were called in by the government and they were they were doing tons of stuff so we had significant amount of work plus that was that challenge of knowing that we were working on coronavirus so we had to be extraordinarily scrupulous about everything that was happening and um, writing all kind of protocols went all the way up to the president of the university although I'm not really sure how much he knew about how stringent you needed to be, but that's okay. Um, and then we started uh, three weeks ago into phase one. And phase one was is a very limited reopening. Uh, in each lab space, there can be one person, which has made it quite a challenge for our facility because there's a lot, as Ryan alluded to, there's a lot of animals that needed to be come down before or are coming down now because these are long-term studies. And there's just one instrument that can run at a time, and it's put quite a crimp. So we're running 24 hours a day, and I still have a waiting list. So wow. that's kind of a challenge. Yeah, yeah. And we're not even up. I, you know, I told them, <laughs> I don't know what you're going to do when we go to the next phase unless they start figuring a way to make it. Um, there, I think it's called this. This clean or something, it's really expensive, like plastic sheeting. Oh, yeah. And they actually make this clean carols around each of the instruments. I thought oh, that was really? the best way to do it. <laughs> right. That's like kind of like at the supermarket. Now they have the big uh, plexiglass shields in front of everything, the checkers and whatnot. Right. I saw, right. I saw a picture of a, a restaurant interior where they had the curtain, uh, shower curtains around the uh, yeah. shower curtains. Well, you know, you could you could go to the extreme and put the instrument and the person in a bio bubble. There you go. And uh, yeah, now they're fully contained. Yep. Expensive. Yep. Yeah, that might be a price, a little bit pricey. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought this clean was expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so but, I but, but it's, it's going well. It's so well that's going well. Great. I feel your pain because like we, we are just restarting at the University of Chicago and, and 
we kind of go in to staff, two members of the staff at a time, and it, it does feel like way more work because like everybody shows up on the instruments. We, we kind of limit the, the, the space, but it, uh, in, our, in our facility, I have tons of space, so I have tons of users showing up. So it, it does bring a, a lot of work for very few people. So I, I do feel your, uh, your pain there. Yeah, now we have to approve every single user's reservation on iLab to make sure we have one instrument that yeah we're not planning on moving that not so. anymore i think i'm done moving stuff yeah so we have one Some instrument people might not know laura and i work in the same lab so that's why we are <laughs> um so we have one instrument that's really close to two other ones that basically three people sort of back to back uh, so we have to confirm that if somebody books one of those instruments, then we have to block out the other two. Yeah. Because otherwise they will be sitting too close together, which means that we have to have somebody monitoring all of the schedules and confirming all of the, um, the bookings that get made right now, which is kind of time consuming for us, but time consuming and it's easy to make a mistake on those kind of things because you're looking at all of these different schedules and jumping back and forth. Yeah, that's why I, I just, <laughs> I thought I could, I'm just running the whole schedule now because it's much easier for me to do it than to, to do that because I was just making mistakes all over the place, so. Well, I think like, don't you, so I don't know, maybe this is not the case, but uh, if you're running, well, A, if you run plates, um, the amount of like hands-on instrument time that you're in there setting something up could be pretty minimal. Um, so in, in my group, in my lab, it's, I'd say 90 plus percent plate run. So every instrument has a plate loader. So be people basically just come in, load up their plate, make sure it's running okay, and then they leave. Which in that case, that, that actually works to our advantage and frees up a lot of space. And so. I haven't worried about schedule, like conflicts on scheduling, but I think, you know, basically putting the onus back on the user and saying, hey, if you come in the lab and there's two people sitting down at an instrument setting up their plate, you know, you could just confirm with them, hey, you know, can I come back in 15 minutes or whatever to set up my plate? By that time, they're gone and you can come in and put your plate in. And that keeps most of the instruments running, you know, close to capacity. Um, but yeah, I guess if you're running tubes, you obviously can't do that. Um, or, you know, for the, the, the person who is, uh, let's say a little bit more controlling than most who needs to watch every single sample run through the instrument, you know, maybe they don't want to leave their, their uh, leave it and just uh, hope that everything goes well. But I, I would guess that maybe now is the time to, to, bring back the old uh, log me in or, or uh, remote desktop on Windows or something like that to monitor things from afar. You know, if you're able to load a plate up and go. Right. For a while, we didn't have a lot of plate loaders on our instruments. That's something that is changing slowly yeah. in our facility. Um, hey, listen, so I wanted to talk a bit about Chug. Uh, just a five, 10 minutes, just to explain what we're trying to do. Chug has been uh, sort of, I think of it as the uh, uh, undying, ever present, but never quite there uh, uh, meeting in, 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 in the flow stomp world. Like we've been there, look, I've moved in Chicago in like 15 years ago uh, this year and Chug was already a thing and it's been there for all these years, but just never, um, never quite picked up, and um, I kind of got a boost this year. I, I want to say because of COVID nineteen, because we were kind of gunning for this uh, a meeting every six months, a meeting every three months, something where we we find a venue, we find the people, we find a speaker, we we go to a place and uh, listen to the person, and then COVID nineteen showed up, and suddenly we decided, oh, let's do something on the let's do something online and then everything will be much easier. So and it was very successful. Well, so far, so, so far, so good. 
We have a really good talk with the uh, with uh, um, Dave and with Tim. Him. Tim. Yes, Tim. Sorry. <laughs> we can edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> if we if we if we start editing everything that I forget, we're we're <laughs> left in the. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I, I guess the chug. So this time around, we're trying something a bit different, where uh, we're we're getting closer with the other core facility uh, in the city. So we we have talked to the people at Northwestern, to the people at the University of Illinois in Chicago, and what we're trying to do. Uh, there's multiple goals. I feel like one of them is uh, just generating a database of really basic information about flow cytometry. Um, one of these, uh, for example, the, on, on the University of Chicago blog, uh, one of the one that is consulted, like it's way above everyone, everyone else is, uh, the, the, book, the, the blog was called by, uh, was written by Ryan, um, like a while ago, but it, it's called, uh, uh, what is MFI? And, and here's a really simple question. The, the, the question, the answer has not changed over the years. And, and this is still a question that people uh, keep asking. Like you, you go on the, the Purdue list uh, and, and people still discuss this type of, uh, of thing. So uh, that, that would be one goal, just getting a, a, all these information in a single spot on our website and, and make it, it a, 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 an interesting catalog of flow time tree information. Um, and, and I guess the second one was generating a, 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 a group or a getting people together uh, to discuss flow stamp tree. And, and here we're kind of, I'm using a scattershot approach where uh, the, 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 the website as a blog, as a, a forum, uh, we're trying this uh, um, podcast format tonight. So it's, we're, we're kind of using whatever uh, tools we had at our disposal and, and trying to figure out what is going to stick. Yeah, not just maybe what's going to stick, but I think, yeah, I think different topics um, require different formats, right? So mm. it would be hard to have Dave Novo's talk in a podcast format, right? Right, Because he needs to show data, he needs to do all this kind of stuff. But, you know, things like we're doing tonight, um, right, it would be silly for David to pop up some slides and, and go through bullet points of text when we can just go ahead and talk through it. So, I mean, I think, you know, it's not my idea, but I, I think it's a good idea uh, just to have a variety of formats available that are tailored for the, the, the different needs. So, I mean, if it's, a, if it's a quick tip or topic, like what is MFI? Yes, a, a blog post is kind of the ideal thing to do, or you know, maybe you'd say a, a little 30 second YouTube video or something like that. Um, if it's kind of a technical um, or you know, scientific driven uh, presentation, then yeah, kind of the webinar format with slides is the perfect venue for it. So, 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 so great idea, whoever's idea that was. <laughs> <laughs> probably, a, probably from the hive mind. Yeah, yeah, all of us together. Yeah. Um, so we, as I said before, we're on the 33rd uh, of June. Uh, a big thing that happened, COVID obviously, but it, it uh, shut down everything and uh, canceled Saito, which is, those of you who might not be aware of the, the meeting, it's basically the giant meeting in, in, the, in the, the world of flow cytometry. Uh, everybody wants to go to Saito because this, 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 that's the place where all the, the big release uh, are going to be. This is where the, the, big, the greatest minds in the field are, are going to meet, uh, the, the best scientific talks and so on. All of that got canceled and nobody's going anymore. So we were kind of uh, left at, back at home. And, and suddenly, instead of a Saito meeting, we had a bunch of webinars. Uh, every single vendor decided, okay, we're going to present our stuff on a webinar format now. And, and since everybody is stuck at home, they'll be available to, to watch all of this stuff. And 
Um, the first question I would have for you guys is, did you, um, so what, what did you, did you take any advantage of this, uh, this sea of webinars showing up uh, at your door? Personally liked the webinars. <laughs> I know not everyone did, um, but I liked having webinars just for the way my work from home is currently structured. There isn't a lot of structure, so I kind of liked having a scheduled webinar at certain times of the day and then planning my day around that. Um, and there were some interesting topics, I thought. Um, so personally, I kind of liked using it to sort of break up my day, even though sometimes the webinars were a bit longer and got to be a little bit overwhelming. I know there was one group who did like a week's worth of webinars. That was that was a lot to sit through. <laughs> I don't think I watched all of those, but I definitely enjoyed having, you know, two or three webinars a week. I didn't find that to be terrible. Well, I enjoyed the webinars that I did. I, I was in the lab, so I didn't see as many of them. But one of the things I thought was really great was um, AACR did their meeting all virtual and it was actually free. And so the first half of it was in uh, April and the second half is actually Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of this week. And um, they have 87,000 people who have tuned into that webinar, which I think is pretty phenomenal. Wow. Yeah. And, and the whole technology was seamless. So I was very impressed with how they got it all done together. And, and they just subsidized it by having a little donate button up in the corner. And they said, you know, because of obviously dramatically reduced costs by having a virtual meeting, they made more money at this virtual meeting charging nothing than they do at a regular big meeting. So I thought that was kind of an interesting statistic. Of course, you know, they got a little more clout. They, more people know about AACR than know about Chug, but, um, <laughs> but it's all scope. So, right. you know, I, I'm, I'm encouraged that there is a real need. And I think even more so, even when we get back to what, you know, being out more and all of that, I think people have come to appreciate to a certain degree being home too. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes if you have meetings virtually as well, it's easier for people to do it because if you've got to go someplace and find parking and go there and, you know, and all of that, that adds another couple hours to it. So, you know, if it's not always a face-to-face -face meeting, I think that gives some people, particularly if they have children that they want to go home and be with, you know, if they don't want to go home and be with their children, then they can go to the meetings. But, you know, <laughs> that's just my idea. Yeah. And I think that's, that's, and like, yeah, the AACR thing was, was great uh, to be able to tap into that. Uh, right. Cause normally, you know, we, we're always encouraged to go to meetings like that, but, you know, we're not going to send the whole lab there. So a few people get to go each year. Uh, but now, yeah, everybody can tune in, hear all the, all the great talks. I think the one thing that was a little bit um, of a letdown was um, just as good as the technical quality was for AACR, some of them were just really bad. Um, and it just was painful to watch. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, you had the typical stuff like background noise, um, you know, people not muting their lines, or or even the ones that are a little bit more professionally done. I don't, I can't remember what outfit this is, but they're so like rigid and strict, um, and everything is very well scripted that it just doesn't feel genuine then, uh, and it just feels like you know, somebody's reading a script and like they don't really even know the words that are coming out of their mouth. They're just saying them. Whereas, you know, I think uh, some, something that's casual enough and look and feel, but is still, you know, technically sound. So you're not having a bunch of buffering issues and whatnot uh, is really, is really idea, ideal. And uh, I know, I know we'll talk about this later, but uh the the comedic relief from the uh the bigfoot <laughs> webinar uh right. was classic can we, can we describe <laughs> it a bit so we're, again we'll get back to the instrument <laughs> either but the, oh the, man the 
So Propel Labs, uh, early May, sent an email and they, they want to announce the release of their new Bigfoot cell sorter. Uh, and they, they generate all this buzz because it, it would be the very first uh, uh, spectral flow stometry cell sorting instrument available on the market. So it's a big deal. And we show up on the 20th and then we look at the thing and then there's, there's this is this is a live performance because you know it's yeah what we see is like a, a machine behind a bunch of house plants <laughs> and then the guy in a monkey suit shows up and then pushes the plants and then hugs the machine yeah it was so cheesy it was <laughs> actually good uh, it, like I was about to say that i i love it i yeah <laughs> I, this is of all the meeting, all the webinars I've seen, this is the one I remember the clearest. Exactly. And I think yeah. that was, you know, maybe not by design. Maybe that's, I, I mean, that is kind of just their ethos there is kind of being a little silly. Um, but from a marketing standpoint, I mean, it was definitely memorable. And uh, everybody who tuned in uh, definitely caught their attention right away. So, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I think, you know, the, the webinars, um, obviously a great medium uh, to pass on information like that, but, you know, there's got to be a, a little bit of uh, flair or, or substance to it that's just not all, you know, regurgitating what's on slides and, and getting right. the information out there. So kudos to them. And, and this is a good segue into uh, what we can expect because like now that Saito has canceled, they have announced that uh, they're going to do a two day meeting uh, where presumably like there's, there's not that many details uh, just yet on what's going to be presented, but presumably it's going to be uh, the people who are supposed to give presentations at, during the uh, in-person meeting who are now going to do it uh, on, on, on the webinar essentially. And, and, from from what I've seen from the Saito presentation so far, they they have not shied. They have not moved that far away from uh, this, uh, you know, presenter talks about the slides, and then we move to another presenter, and there's very little. It's, it's all very uh, strict um, uh, uh, format, right? And I also wonder how they're going to justify the, the prices that they're charging because, you know, when you pay for a meeting, you're paying for the meeting space, you're paying for the rooms for the speakers and for their plane fare and for all the paper products that are there and, you know, coffee and all of that stuff. And uh, we don't have any of those charges anymore. So it's hard to justify, what is $150, I think, per right. person to see a virtual okay. meeting for two days. Mm -hmm. I, I think there is some cost into in, for example, here we're you, you, we're using a Zoom account, uh, so you need to pay for that. So maybe there's, I, I'm not aware of what is needed for a meeting for the scope that Saito wants to do, but uh, I, I, it's it's a it's a it's a bit tone deaf in my opinion because. And all the universities, so meetings are paid by the universities, right? They're going to send their people, they're going to pay for a registration, the, the, the housing, the food, and so on. Uh, and so if the universities decide that they are in dire uh, budget crisis uh, and they decide not to send anybody out, then why would a meeting decide to... Like, I, we can't pay for that, that 150 bucks or what? Yeah, they, they probably see it as that's, that's so inexpensive and you're kind of getting, you know, a good chunk of the site of meeting right. that, you know, $150. Well, yeah, Who, who's going to say no to that? But I don't think they understand university spending uh, right. as well as I think they might. Like it's too expensive for me to pay for that, but the university won't pay it for me. So, like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I, I wonder if um, you know they might hear some complaints like that, and maybe either create some additional uh, cost structure for university people or whatnot. 
or you know perhaps the the fee that you pay gets you there live and maybe the ability to answer questions and, or ask questions and whatnot but some of the stuff might be wrapped into like site OU type stuff where if you are a, an ISAC member you're going to get access to it anyways after the fact so I wouldn't be surprised if things end up there um, for consumption after the fact it's just you don't have the benefit of you know, if you had a burning question, you wouldn't be able to, you know, put it in the chat and ask it at that time. Yeah. If you had a, uh, going back to the production value of webinars, if you had a, the, the, the number one complaint uh, that you might have and that you would like to people to fix, what, what would it be? Sound quality. <laughs> yeah, Sound quality. absolutely. It's a hard one to fix. Um, cause not all microphones even necessarily help. Um, but yeah. Well, I thought the, well, and so I, I noticed the three of you are, none of you are using headphones or anything like that. Yep. And I was under the impression that the sound coming out of the computer would get picked up by a mic and kind of create a weird feedback. I mean, I've, I've seen stuff like that happen before. It doesn't seem to be happening here. I mean, everything, everybody sounds great, uh, which is why I switched to wearing a headset because then I know there is absolutely no sound coming out of my computer or anything like that that's going to get picked up by the mic. But um, yeah, I don't know why in some cases that seems to be a problem for that, but not here at least. Yeah, I've noticed on other apps, like I was doing a Google Hangout with my friends and one person was having horrible feedback issues. Yeah. Um, I don't think I've ever encountered it on Zoom, so maybe they've figured out how to maybe. minimize mm -hmm. feedback. I'm not sure if I've noticed feedback as much of a problem um, in webinars, just mainly the general quality, so it just sounds really like scratchy or tinny. Yeah, right. And that's right, so... You're, yeah, I guess there's a, also a difference, and, and I take it all, all of us are joined with computer audio. We're not using a phone, so I think that also changes the, the tone that you hear. You can definitely tell when somebody's like on a phone or on their you know, speakerphone talking through that. It's, it definitely sounds much different. I, I, I'm kind of, I follow the 538 uh, podcast on YouTube. And at the beginning, when they, they uh, first started doing it from uh, remotely, uh, all the person, all the people on that webinar had their phones stuck on their under their. <laughs> was, uh, really? <laughs> yeah, I, I I I haven't learned enough about sound quality in webinars to to figure out why that that was needed. But well, I'll do it if you want. Yeah, I'll do it next time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would say that's the most difficult. Well, if it's if the person just has a bad microphone or bad room, like maybe they don't have enough rugs in their room or something and it's echoing off the walls a bunch, um, then it's just sort of painful to sit through however long they're talking. Um, or every once in a while you get people who have like internet connection problems and then they'll sound kind of garbled for a couple of seconds, but then it clears up. So it's usually not too obnoxious. And you know, if it's a group of people, then usually they can say, oh, can you repeat that? You cut out for a second. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just hard when somebody has really terrible quality and you just have to sit through that for 20, 30, 60 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, you stuff before that. You just <laughs> <laughs> and if anybody has any problems with our video or audio quality, well, that's send an email to David Leclerc at. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh no! I think as you said that your internet quality went down. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on. Um, and we come back from Saito, well, I mean, I guess tomorrow, um, 
we we would have all these beautiful machines in mind. Uh, presumably, um, the big uh, push at Sony would have been for the new uh, Spectral Flow Stamper ID7000. And so anybody wants to give me a rough overview of that, that, uh, that machine? No? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can try. I, I can do it. All right, let's hear it, David. Okay, so, so essentially Sony, um, Sony was actually the first group to come with uh, spectral flow cytometer. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they had the two machines before SciTech decided to come out with their own. Um, Commercial. But, Come again? Commercial. Commercial, yes. Well, yeah. yes, yes. Great point. Um, <laughs> the, the big difference with this machine is that finally Sony decided to spatially separate all of their lasers. So now yeah. uh, you can look at way more parameters at the same time. Uh, you have way more detectors in each of the, uh, in, in your instruments. Uh, that allows you to a uh, wider range of, of stuff to look at. Um, so Sony, uh, so right now, uh, SciTech Aurora is uh, the, the main competitor on that, that market. Uh, five lasers and uh, 68 detectors, wow. right? 64. 64? Fluorescence. Right. Yes, fluorescence, okay. And then uh, Sony comes now with seven lasers and 188 detectors. And so yeah. the two additional laser lines, uh, so you would have the, the basic, uh, the blue line, so 48, uh, four or five divided, 640 uh, would be, I might be off on a few nanometers there, but the red, um, the UV laser, the 561 line, and then they would add two more, uh, the, oh, hold on. The 325 DPUV. And then a uh, 808, 808 808 IR. Yes. And so my question at this point is what do you do with those two laser lines? Let's start, yeah. let's start. Have you guys looked into uh, the machine at all or? Yeah, I mean, I think it was, you know, after spending some time on the Aurora, I mean, it, I, I feel like I'm basically sold on spectral cytometry in general. I mean, if it's, if it's not like a, you know, four laser workhorse that I'm going to buy for people to just run their six color stuff, I'm probably buying something that's spectral. So having the ID7000 along with the Aurora, really the only game in town at this point. Um, but yeah, so it's definitely something interesting. And I think, you know, before they had a decent spectral uh, cytometer, let's see, one of them had some spatial resolution of the lasers, but it didn't have a plate loader. And the other one had a plate loader and they were all collinear. So finally, I think they got it right and put, you know, a good sample loader that does plates and tubes along with spatially separated lasers. Um, but yeah, I think to your first question, uh, the, the deep UV, the deep UV is what I'm struggling with. I mean, I know there could be, for example, another uh, deep UV excited polymer that gets tandemed up with a bunch of things to give you another eight colors off of that. Uh, I haven't seen anything in, in real life, I mean, I've, I've seen uh, or heard anecdotes here and there of various groups developing stuff like that, but there's nothing that you would buy commercially today that is excited better by 325 than it is by 355. I mean, the only thing that I could think of is calcium bound endo, uh, which, give, which gives you a little bit better excitation than 355 would. But I mean, you know, nobody really does that very much anymore. <laughs> and B, the 355 works just fine for it. So uh, the IR is actually a little bit more interesting because there are a few dyes. Um, and so maybe, yeah, maybe you're not going to get a bunch of dyes off of it. But let's say you, you 
you relegate your live dead and your dump channel to the IR laser. Uh, and that's just, you know, two more channels that you get to work with for phenotyping then off the, off the other lasers. So I know Coulter has um, at least their, their live dead die uh, because they've had an IR laser on their Cytoflex for a while now. They at least have a, a, a live dead die off of that line. And um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a definitely an interesting laser line that can be used for very simple things that are bimodal and easy to resolve. But yeah, I, I, I still don't see at this point a use case for that, that DPUV. It also actually adds one more issue too, because the lower you go, the more problems you have with autofluorescence. That's true. And even, you know, I would say, well, so I know that for most organic compounds that might be generated, say, at a pharmaceutical company, <laughs> um, fluoresce at those low wavelengths. And that's actually, I think, just in the, in the industry in general, one method to ensure that you've properly cleaned your, your, your instrumentation from a compound is they use deep UV light to try and pick up uh, fluorescence uh, signatures from any trace minerals or compounds that might be left over from a previous batch or something like that. So yeah, I mean, I guess 320, 325 is a little bit higher than that application. You know, that's closer to the, you know, the 290, 280 range, but yeah, like you said, Laura, I mean, I, I wonder, you know, what the autofluorescence is going to be off that laser or, or, you know, maybe, maybe one embraces that and makes that your autofluorescence laser uh, creates a good spectral signature off of it and now easily subtracts that from, you know, the rest of your laser lines. So I don't know. I, I'm a little bit uh, iffy yet on that deep UV. But, um, you know, a six laser instrument would still be plenty nice. Yeah. Do you, do you get to choose? I'm not sure. Yeah, I think they do a three laser and up. Okay. They also changed the way, so they, they are using PMTs, but the- They're still using their, I think they're still using their like 32 channel PMT array. Right that they had in the previous instruments. I, I think it's still the same product. Maybe it's, you know, better specs or something like that, but right, in right. general, it's the same. And they are now fine tuning the laser power instead of the voltage on the each of these uh, detectors, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, because, you know, I think when you talk to them and when you talk to SciTech, you know, they definitely disagree about the desire, need, or even the validity of increasing detector gains um, as a percentage or, or even, you know, as a few detectors here and there. Because when the, the Aurora first came out, um, they actually, you know, didn't promote, but said it would be allowable to lower gains on a few detectors that went off scale. I know, I know since then they've changed to the percentage based uh, increase or lowering of the gains on the detectors when things are too bright. But um, Meaning even you then, need to decrease on the entire number, on the entire. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So take, take down 10% across the whole range of a laser's emission channel. So, you know, blue laser, 14 channels, take them all down by 10%. Um, but I think, you know, if, if you're going to spend the time and fine tune detectors to respond optimally at a given gain or voltage, why mess with that? You know, why start adjusting detectors up and down if you could just achieve the same thing by moving the laser power up and down to bring very bright stuff on scale? You know, that, that sounds like it's probably a good, a good way of doing it. Um, you know, I think the other way to address that and 
And I'd say the Aurora is capable of doing this is you just have a big enough dynamic range, you know, actual usable range above autofluorescence that you don't have too much stuff falling off scale. Um, I know when we, when we set our, our voltages on say the, the X20, you know, using one of the various methods that are out there, uh, PMT optimization methods, there's quite a few things that end up going off scale and require you to, you know, reduce the voltage down a little bit. I mean, it, not to say that it doesn't happen on the Aurora, but it happens less frequently. I think because you, you're genuinely getting another half log or log across any color that you want to look at of actual usable range uh, to be able to, to put both those very bright things and still retain good resolution on the dim particles all in one scale. And I think that's um, probably the same on the Sony instruments, at least it was on their previous instruments, uh, having that high dynamic range, but adding the ability to tweak and tune the laser power um, and, and, and even making that your standard protocol, I think, uh, I think is a, a smart way to go about it. Matt, I know you have on your on your uh, wish list. There's a spectral pulsometer. Does does do you see a, a difference now between, or, or would would the Sony attract you more than the SciTech instrument at this point? Or well, yeah, for a lot, it comes down to money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I don't even know what the Sony cost because when Stephen Whitaker came to see me. He gave me the thing and he said I had to sign a non-disclosure agreement before they could give me a quote. And I sent it to the lawyers and they said, we're not going to sign an NDA for a quote. If they can't just give us a quote, we don't get a quote and we don't buy that instrument. Okay. So I don't really have a choice if I buy one <laughs> at this point, unless they change their, their tunes or if I can have a compelling reason why we would have to have that instrument. Mm -hmm. and, and I would imagine a seven laser instrument with all those channels is going to be a little pricey. Well, I mean, it ought to be. It's, it's yeah, providing... TV I know is really, really expensive. Yeah. Yeah, I think a, a five laser configured one, I'd be surprised if it were, you know, outside the range of a, a five laser for Tessa, you know, whatever that is. I don't know. Is that like 400 these days? Five laser for Tessa or cheaper? I think so. Yeah, I mean, I think the other, the, well, I mean, compared to the um, Aurora, I mean, plate or sample handling is another thing that uh, I have spent a lot more time being critical of and looking at instruments. Um, you know, just having a variety of input capabilities switching from plates to tubes to 384 well plates or or bigger deep well plates etc um, having that variety is pretty attractive and i think any instrument where you have to do hardware manipulations to move things in and out of plate mode or tube mode or things like that is just um you know not very desirable to me at this point, I think, well, I, I'd say the best Im implementation of sample handling that, that I've seen thus far is the, uh, the Novasite, um, the Novasite, Quantion, you know, those are essentially the same thing. Um, the, 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 the Yeti, what is that called now? Um, ZE5, 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 that's another one. Things like that, that, you know, basically take a, um, a hard look at the interaction points of a user. I mean, as a user, I don't interact with the lasers or the filters per se. Um, I interact with sample loading, do that a lot, and I interact with software. So right. in my mind, sample loading and software should be the top of every, every manufacturer's list of just getting those things right, making them super user-friendly. Right. 
everything else that happens behind the scenes, sure, yeah, that, that all has to be good. I mean, good electronics, good lasers, good detectors, all that. But really, uh, usability, I mean, all the instruments are so good. If you, if you put any of the new instruments against um, a caliber or a canto or something like that, it, 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 it beats them, you know, nine times out of 10. And uh, they're so good that the spec wars are kind of done with. I mean, saying, you know, I do more colors or you do more colors or I, I can detect 50 MESF FITCs and you could detect 40 MESF FITCs. Uh, that doesn't really matter. I mean, it's really focusing on ease of use, uh, usability, and really the two points of entry for that are are going to be the sample loading and the software, which, I mean, sample loading, I think we got good examples. Software, I mean, yeah, uh, that might be personal preference, but I, I'm still waiting for a, a good one that I say, yes, you've done it. This is what I've been waiting for. Um, I feel like I've done that with sample loading. Nice. Um, can we move to the uh, Bigfoot cell sorter? Oh yeah. Can, uh, so maybe Ryan, you might know, Pat, do you know the history of uh, Propel Labs? No, I do not. You do not? No. So Ryan, you wanna give the, the background here? They, they, they have a link, I, I know they have a link with uh, Cytomation. Yeah, Cytomation is where it kind of all started. Right. Uh, in Fort Collins, where, where Propel is today. And, um, you know, so Cytomation came out with the MoFlow. That was kind of the, the, the best sorter circa late 90s, 2000. And, um, you know, its claim to fame was speed. You know, sorting, you know, even at that time, they were saying, oh, we could sort 50,000 cells per second. You know, take that with a grain of salt. But it's funny to see that even today, one of the signatures of these instruments that are coming out from Propel is speed. And I mean, they have, as far as I know, um, or, or, or uh, I would boast to say, probably the, the best um, electronics engineer uh, around the business and maybe across other businesses because because Dan Fox, I mean, he is just amazing and kind of the stuff he and his team get to crank out in their little uh, uh, clay pen there in, in Fort Collins of just coming up with all these crazy electronics that just do amazing things. And, you know, I've been a skeptic for a long time, but um, yeah, when I, when I test things like the ZE5 for speed, I am able to acquire 100,000 events per second and have no aborts. And I'm like, man, I really wanted that to be wrong. So I could say, see, you don't know how to do this, but no, no, it's true. But, uh, but anyway, so Cytomation got bought by uh, DACO. DACO. So then they became DACO Cytomation. Um, the Cyan was around at that time, an analyzer that was first created by Cytomation, but then uh, kind of get uh, filled out and, and finished really, and DACO Cytomation. And that, DACO kind of spun off Cytomation, and that was eventually bought by Coulter. Um, and uh, so, so that part of the business, kind of the Coulter or Cytomation part of the business is still the I don't know what they call it these days, but it's still some iteration of the MoFlow mm -hmm. um, with a bunch of letters after it. And then a group of them, you know, slowly regrouped back in Fort Collins and created Propel. And essentially Propel's business model is, you know, they, they put all their money into R&D uh, to develop these cool tools, but they're not really there to do you know, sales and marketing and instrument support long-term. I mean, they'll get things started, but that's about it. And then the last two instruments that they have, first the Avalon, which became the S3 sorter that Sony purchased from Propel. 
uh, uh, BioRed, or sorry, BioRed, yeah. BioRed purchased from Propel, and then BioRed uh, also purchased the Yeti, which is their analyzer, and that is called some other god-awful name, <laughs> ZE5, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, so, you know, likely that's th that will probably happen again. The, the Bigfoot that they came out with, um, you know, has all the, the bells and whistles you'd want on a sorter and more. And, uh, you know, whether BioRed picks that up like they have with other instruments or, or somebody else, I'm, I'm sure that will be happening in the next six months to a year or something like that. The, the reason I wanted to go back in the, the, the history long past is that l watching the uh, presentation on the Bigfoot, I totally felt the, the MoFlo feel. It, it, they, they present you with the option of, I think it's up to nine lasers or something, which is like you, you can put whatever you want. The MoFlo had a giant laser table that you can screw whatever you wanted on. This is the exact same thing. You just, they, they <laughs> offer you the ability to use whatever line you can possibly want. They don't really care what you do whatever you want to do, you'll, you'll be able to do it. Um, and the plate loader was the other thing that, that struck my, uh, my the plate, plate sorter. The, the plate sorting on that machine is just amazing. I've never seen anything quite like it. I don't go out much, I grant you that, but uh, I've been working on the area for over a decade now and uh, the plate loader is a bit clunky. It moves, it, it's noisy. Uh, to, to see a, a, a sort on a 96 plate, uh, 96 wall plate take, I don't know, it took 10 seconds. Five seconds was it? Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's well, four so, was very quick. Should we explain what? Yeah, go ahead and, and yeah, sure. explain that method that they're doing. Um, oh, so I guess the, the ARIAs, the traditional sorters, um, will sort one single stream. So we'll just put one droplet into each well and it'll sort of go down a row and then serpentine motion through the entire plate. Um, so it's got to sort 96 individual times. Um, but in the Sasquatch, um, Bigfoot. They, or Bigfoot, same thing, <laughs> Bigfoot, um, they still utilize the sorting. So like if you would do a, a four-way sort into tubes, they use that four-way sort, um, but they do it in plates. So if you have a 96 wall plate, which is uh, eight rows across, um, then they just sort four at a time down the plate and then back again. So two passes and you're done with the plate, which is pretty nifty. <laughs> Which, which I think is definitely feasible in a 96 well format, right? Because I think the, you know, if you do any 3D4 well sorting, kind of angle of incidence plays a little bit more of a part there. And you sorting at an angle, right? You have that, your stream coming down at an angle like this and a well like that. So, you know, how do you find that center of the bottom accurately? Which is why, you know, like the, um, original MoFlo even, we would always bend the waistline off to the side, charge the waste stream, deflect that, and then sort droplets straight down into each well. So you absolutely hit dead center on the well every single time. You can do that on the Bigfoot, one stream at a time. So you can move the waste over, deflect the waste, and then sort vertically if you wanted to, but then you're just doing the, the traditional one well at a time. Right. Still probably faster because it's you know so smooth and so quick and the stepper motors are nicely tuned but um, you know I think if you're doing this four-way sorting or four stream sorting into a plate um, yeah I, I think the the 96 well which is usually at least half filled with fluid is a big enough target that sorting on that angle doesn't really matter but when they did the same thing with uh, a 384 well plate, now with the 384, did they do 
six streams or you actually did the eight way eight streams yeah right I, so they put eight streams today <laughs> yeah right so eight streams which means that eighth stream um has to be at quite an angle right and how do you hit the bottom of a 384 well tube at such an angle i mean they're Is doing the it angle I, I didn't notice what's that is the plate itself at an angle? No. Well, so it's sorting on both sides of the waste catcher. So you, so yeah, normally, oh, like yeah. I, I made a, or I had our machine shop mill a 3D four well plate holder for our aria that is tilted at like 11 and a half degrees, so that the angle matches the angle of incidence of the stream matches the angle that the well is sitting at to increase our you know hit rate for 3D four well plates. But if you're on both ends of the stream, then you know you'd have to have like a, a U-shaped plate, which I don't right. think those exist yet. <laughs> maybe well, uh, maybe Fisher will make one now. Who yeah. knows? It it might still work. We don't know. I guess one of us will need to buy one of one Bigfoot and test it. <laughs> let us, let us know. Pat, I'll try. Yeah, I'll I'll see what my budget is on that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what about this uh, spectral cytometry business? So it was announced as a spectral flow cytometer cell sorting instrument, um, but it's still an instrument that has dedicated detectors for each uh, floor four. So in that sense, it's a traditional cell sorting. I guess they just have a, an unmixing uh, uh, algorithm that allows you to uh, look at the data on all, all these different detectors and on mix and I guess we haven't seen any data, but potentially uh, get better resolution between different parameters that you're trying to uh, resolve. So is that something that you think would be useful at this point on this type of technology or we, we really need uh, an optimized God bless you, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> you sound <laughs> near me. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was a quick move on the mute button there. Thank you. <laughs> well, here, here's, the, here's the thing about, about spectral and mixing. I think, you know, as soon as you get to, well, let, let's say the, the higher wavelength lasers, like the, the yellow and the, and the red, where there's not that much runway past the excitation source. Once you start breaking that up into five or six or seven channels with detectors, I mean, you basically have enough resolution to do good spectral and mixing. I mean, if you end up, when we do, when we collect data, say on a symphony, where we have, uh, I don't know what they call them, decagons or whatever, uh, we have eight PMTs off the violet or, and, and eight off the UV. If you apply spectral and mixing in Flojo on that data, you do get better uh, resolution and less spreading overall when you compare, you know, a multicolor assay. So, so yeah, I mean, even if you're doing a, a traditional, whatever, 15 color sort, if you add in the spectral and mixing, it seems to me that you will be able to get uh, better resolution of dim double positives because you're going to be reducing that, that spreading. Now, the only thing that I was a little bit unsure of is doing that level of unmixing on cells going through at 100,000 events per second. Uh, doing the unmixing as well as applying uh, sort droplet criteria of whether you're going to charge it or not. I mean, that seems kind of crazy, but, um, but yeah, at this point I have, I have no choice but to uh, take them at their word until I can get my hands on it. But, you know, I, I would say just as a matter of practice, um, you should look at all your data at least every once in a while and apply some spectral and mixing to it. You know, as long as you are, um, you have some extra channels, you know, you're not, you haven't loaded up your Fortessa or your Symphony. So if you're doing, I don't know, let's say you're doing 10 color stuff on your Fortessa, 
Yeah, keep all 18 channels on, um, collect all the data, make sure it's all on scale, throw those controls into Flojo and do some, some special and mixing and, and see what it gets you. And the, the few times that I've, that I've actually gone and tried to do that, I was pleasantly surprised that um, the quality of the data, especially in terms of spreading, was actually better on the back end um, than if I were just doing traditional matrix compensation. Right. I kind of naively thought that Propel Labs had actually leaped and did a, an actual uh, spectral flow cell sorting with the, the array of detectors for each laser and so on. But uh, I, I, I think now that it might just be one way to, because if you do that, you, you kind of beat the market. You're the first cell sorting that does that. And uh, I guess Bigfoot does it anyway, because they're the, f the first one to, to pr 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 present that, that option anyway. But um, it, it wouldn't surprise me to see that uh, very quickly we'll see these uh, optical bench uh, be replaced by detectors I read that are, are just optimized for spectral flow. Like you, you could buy your uh, Bigfoot, you could buy your Symphony S6 and whenever the companies have it ready, they'll just come in and upgrade the instrument to a, a spectral machine. It's a bit, it's a bit my, um, the fear I have. I currently have a, a, an ARIA 2 that I need to replace and I'm waiting for a spectral cell sorter to come out because I don't want to be the last guy to buy a, you know, a traditional cell sorting instrument and then be stuck with that for the next, you know, whatever, 10 years. So, so that would probably be one of my, um, my requests if I decided to go with a Bigfoot with a S6 uh, Symphony. It would, would be to add the option whenever they, they come out uh, to, to upgrade the instrument, uh, optical layout. Well, I think the, you know, that's a, that's a good point, the upgradability, because really there's, there's nothing, theoretically it should just be software, yeah. correct? Yeah. Um, but I think, and I, and I, I, I don't know um, if people are seriously implementing this, implementing this strategy, but I think there's kind of a, a hybrid method that maybe the Bigfoot is, is pointing towards but I think the you know kind of the the Sony way and the the SciTech way has been to create essentially bands of similar width across the full emission spectra and just say that's that's what we're going to break it up into but you can imagine there's areas of that um, band or that spectra that are you know very crowded or areas that are, you know, very uncrowded. And it might require, say, more resolution in those crowded areas so you can better um, get better pinpointing of signature that are slightly different and maybe open up those dimmer areas so you actually collect more light. You know, it's kind of balancing those two ends of, this, of the, uh, the equation. Right. And so you could, you could imagine that if somebody went through and put, you know, a bunch of spectrum onto a scale and programmatically or arithmetically or, you know, using machine learning or something like that, divided it up and say, I'm going to put 16 channels in here. What's the optimal way to divide up this spectra into 16 channels? And, and maybe you do have some bands that are, you know, five nanometers wide in some cases, and you have other bands that are 40 nanometers wide. Yeah. And I think, I wonder how much of a, a benefit something like that might do where, where you know, you don't, you, you don't necessarily just, you know, um, generically break up the spectra into somewhat equal bands, but you do it in the context of real life spectra and you say we're going to optimize this area and break it up into smaller chunks and thereby hopefully get better resolution so i, I don't know that that's probably not what 
went into the Bigfoot design, but I could definitely see taking all these examples now, Bigfoot and Aurora and um, the Sony instrument. Sorry, my family's home now. <laughs> uh, and and coming up with a better way of uh, setting these detectors and setting the bands on each of the, the filters. Right. So moving from high-end cell sorting to a machine that at first glance does absolute the opposite, the, the Max Quintito uh, from Milton. Uh, can you let, so has anybody heard? It might just be me because I, we managed to uh, squeeze the purchase of a, a Taito instrument uh, in our facility just before university uh, dropped the ax and decided no more spending. Um, so for the last few months, I've been talking about the title nonstop. So is, is it just me or have you actually seen uh, Neltony's uh, presentation about this instrument, Pat? I have seen it, yes. I've seen the presentation, but you, you're the one who's uh, touting it. Tell us about it. Well, yeah, sure. I just, I, yeah, I just, you know. You kind of bounce it around, I know. <laughs> but I don't so, have the instrument, so I'm not really the one to talk about it. Right. So, so, Max, so Milton e has been talking about the, the title for a few years now, and it's, I feel like they have a weird uh, marketing scheme where they might uh, talk about their instrument and present them at meetings, but not allow anybody to actually buy it. And, and so it's kind of, it's a very strange, uh, uh, because I've, I've known of the title for, I think it's to, since 2017 or something. Um, I thought but, at the beginning it made the most sense for clinical applications. Right, so right. Initial customers were like, strictly clinical and yeah. I don't think they even really advertised it to academia until more recently, if I remember correctly. Well, they, they advertised it, but never allowed us to, you know, play with it, to test it, to, you know. But, but it, it, it essentially uh, breaks this paradigm where cell sorting has to be droplet based and, and goes back to uh, physical uh, arm that will move your droplet containing or, or move the, a, per, a portion of a stream uh, flowing one direction and just bring it to a different channel to, to collect all the, the cells that you want. So it's in that sense, I think it's like what the caliber was doing, um, the, the sorting device, that they, but, but I think it might be the other way around where. Yeah, the caliber was a very, caliber. very, very crude right. um, <laughs> way of what you're thinking, but yeah. The, the caliber would, would actually allow you to, like there was a stream that would fill up the tube at a constant rate and then this little arm would yeah. push the cells in the... Yeah, it would, it would move the tube over oh. and, catch, and catch part of the stream right. during the time when the cell was going by and then it would move back. But in that <laughs> time, you know, it's collecting a bunch of sheath fluid. So your right. sample comes out at like, you know, one cell per mil uh, and you had to run your samples at a very, very low rate in order to allow it to move in and move back. So <laughs> it was uh, right. not ideal, to say the least. So, so the Taito, they bought the fastest... Uh, MEMS. MEMS, you call it? Yeah, M-E-M-S. It's like a uh, mechanical electrical machine or something like that. Okay. That's Actual what they call it. Machine. That's what they call it, yeah. It's crazy. Um, but essentially, uh, you you all the sort is contained within this cartridge. Uh, you put your sample uh, in the first uh, chamber. It gets pushed by air pressure, three psi, so very low pressure, very nice to the cells. Uh, the cells run one after the other in front of these three laser beams. Uh, if the cells you want to collect uh, shows up, then this arm will push uh, the droplet uh, to the first chamber and the flow through ends up in the last chamber. It's a very simple design, but it kind of works really nicely. So 
So um, what's the volume of the droplet when it has a cell that it deflects? It's, it's tiny. So the, okay. um, it, it's, I did a sort today and uh, we, uh, we ended up collecting maybe 200 microliters of sheet and I think it had a million cells or something. Oh. So, so you're, 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 you're not sorting the full giant droplet and so all the, the volume is really, really tiny. So is it okay for really large cells then? There's a ma ma uh, the maximum is 20 micron, uh, but this I think is more due to uh, the, the arm. You might actually start chopping stuff. If yeah. <laughs> um, I, I bought the instrument thinking of uh, sterility issues that we've been battling for years and years and years in the lab. So uh, the, we have a bunch of arias that work great. They can be clean, and when they are clean properly, they will pro uh, give you a, a, a mostly sterile sort. Uh, but whenever users want to collect the cells and put them in culture for a period of a few weeks, maybe, uh, it, it's a challenge because now the machine has to be like squeaky clean. And I just stopped believing that those type of instruments are the proper tool for uh, that task. And I don't know if it's just me, but. Yeah, I don't have that problem with my ARIA. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> no, no, I, it could be something in your water. Yeah, yeah. Or the air pressure or, you know. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, do, I do remember that being a, a struggle at Chicago. Uh, yeah. And I, 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 we've had bouts where, yeah, a few people in a row will get contamination and we do deep cleaning and whatnot. Um, but yeah, recently I'd, I'd say we have, you know, cultures going for, you know, many weeks because we do a lot of clonal sort, sorting for cell line generation, uh, more so than kind of bulk sorting. But uh, those all seem to be pretty good. But yeah, I mean, I think the having kind of the uh, certainty of a slam dunk, absolutely sterile, closed system. If you, got a, if you have a really important project and like very precious cells, I'm going to stick it on a title before I throw it at an ARIA. Yeah. You know, if I only need to sort, you know, GFP positive cells or something like that. So what's the footprint on that instrument? Um, about the same as yeah. an ARIA. Yeah. <laughs> as an ARIA? I think it's like the footprint, I think, is about the same as ARIA, isn't it? Yeah, I would say it's that. Not quite as tall. It's a little bit shorter. Right. Um, and there's no fluidic tanks of any kind, so there's no... Oh, so that's all contained. That has the fluidics in it, the size of the ARIA? Well, there's no fluidics, so... The fluidics is entirely in the chamber. So oh, that's, that's right. That's right. Yeah. There's so. a minor benefit to... I think for our facility, the, the main benefit is the sterility. And yeah. if we have users coming to us saying, I want to sort and the ARIA doesn't work for them, then probably the main problem is sterility. And so we move them to the Taito. Um, but we do have a smaller fraction of people who might want to move to the Taito for unusual or delicate cells because of the pressure. So the Taito being three PSI versus yeah. the ARIA like 70. Yeah. Um, so if they have like really fragile cells or we even have one group who um, has issues with the sheath because they sort sea creatures, um, sea anemone, I believe. Mm -hmm. So they want to do their sorts in salt water instead of sheath buffer because that makes their cells happier. So the benefit of the Taito is you can just put your cells in anything that you want um, <gasps> and it doesn't have to be sheath so so what are the other specs like how fast how many colors stuff like that so it's a eight marker instrument three lasers the blue the red the violet uh the speed uh they don't recommend sorting more than five thousand cells per uh seconds uh because at that point you're you're losing on your efficiency. The, the cells, while it's, the arm while it's moving uh, is letting stuff through. And so at that point, you're, if it's too fast, you, you basically are not 
um, and not being efficient about the way you, you sort. So at that point, the, 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 it's, it's one thing where on that instrument, your sample prep will dictate uh, the quality of the result. So if you don't have the right concentration for the percentage, the, the fraction of the cells that you want to collect, your sort efficiency, the sort purity will be completely off and, uh, and, and it's actually predictable, which is very, very nice. Yeah, yeah. What about the, uh, so is, it, is the uh, illumination and sensing done effectively then in a capillary type system since there's no sheath and therefore maybe no yeah. hydrodynamic focusing or anything like that? That's the big drawback of the instrument. Since there, there's no uh, hydrodynamic focusing, they, they kind of focus the cells in front of the laser beam by have it, having the, 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 the sample running through this weird shaped uh, channel that will kind of, it kind of force the cells to go into a, a current and eventually you, you, they kind of center themselves. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not a physician, I don't know these things. Um, it, it's definitely uh, not as nice as on a uh, regular flow stamper. Um, yeah. so, so, so your, your signals have to be really, really bright to, to be, yeah. to be yeah. able to resolve the yeah. implications. And washing too, right? So you, you, don't, oh, yeah. you can't really have any excess unbound antibody floating around, otherwise that jacks up your background. Right. Um, yeah, that, that's that's a problem that has kind of plagued the uh, the millipore analyzers. I can't remember what those things are called, but they have a capillary mm -hmm. base. The, it was the guava, yeah. Now there's like variations of them, I think. Mm -hmm. But anyways, it's a capillary base system, which basically means that the illumination volume is cell plus all the um, cell media i.e. unbound antibody and fluorophores, whatnot, that all get illuminated in that in that volume there. And if it's not really clean, like, you know, you're not doing an excessive washing, um, that just ruins your resolution and you end up getting high backgrounds on pretty much everything. It's probably, it's probably not a big deal if you're doing like fluorescent protein stuff, but maybe antibody stain stuff would be oh, yeah, yeah. the biggest issue. Right. The, the last point, especially these days with COVID-19, the, uh, the, the biosafety that this instrument offers is just, oh, yeah. you, you don't have to think about it. Like the, the sample is not into any aerosol, so there's no chance of it spinning out of the cartridge and then unless you smash it with a hammer or something. But, uh, and, and, and there is another thing that I kind of like about it is that it's going to be really easy to maintain the instrument, where on a, uh, say my fusion, which is held in a uh, hood, uh, if I decide to decontaminate the hood because it needs some kind of repairs, it's, it's a hassle. It's, yeah. uh, uh, you, you, the, the, you'll need to use uh, either, what is called, uh, hydrogen, vaporized, vaporized hydrogen peroxide and then you, you cross your finger and you hope that your electronics will yeah. not be completely destroyed by the treatment. So like, how do you run uh, like comp control? So do you have to load all your comp control into different cartridges or stuff like that? You know, this is the other thing that I love the machine for this stuff we already talked about, but, <laughs> but, but there's a secret part of me that I, I love the machine because it's it's bad. It's it, it's the worst practice that you can like. I learned my my flow time tree on the cell sorter, and then this is what we do. We just like we don't care about like if you're a really gardener, you 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 want everything by the book and your proper controls and the proper thing. And the, and, and this machine, it you you're not gonna use the hundred dollar cartridge to run your controls because it's it's a hundred dollar cartridge. Come on, and so yeah. so you end up like just. Putting the sample on, you guess your the voltage. You try to find your your separation. The uh, uh, if you have any compensation, it's all manual. Uh, you you can do it by hand if you really want to, but again, it's just too expensive to do it. So you you end up playing with the uh, the, the uh, compensation matrix and then figure out what looks fine and then resolve your population. You gate on it and then voila, 
that's, well, you that's do. so obviously you have to know what yeah. you're look like. controls yeah. um you just don't use a brand new cartridge for every single control so if you have six controls to run use one cartridge you load the first one you run that one through you pipette that out put that back in the same put the next one in the same cartridge run the second control so yes you're sharing the same cartridge which is have you, kind of cool. have, you got, have you gotten to the point where you're like trying to bleach cartridges and reuse them and save them? No, we haven't, we haven't had a chance to uh, figure that one out, but I, I don't think that from what I've seen of the one cartridge I tried to keep around to play with, uh, the valve already broke down. So I think these things are just very fragile. So yeah. by design, by design, sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, I. I I can love that machine. So, when, so if somebody was doing something like actually biohazardous, you know, level two plus or something like that, would would they like load up the cartridge in their lab in the hood and just bring it down, or or how do you guys do that? Yeah, that's the that's what we're doing right now. Okay. Um, there's there's protocols to how you can carry around these uh, these samples. There's to be double bagged mm -hmm. and so on. I think we have one or two COVID sorts, right? Yeah, we, well, we have one, and it turns out that uh, the other group working on a vaccine development were not actually, uh, the, the sample were not coming from patient infected, but they were actually exposing the B cells to portions of the virus and trying to see which one will uh, react the best. Mm. So that was safe. Cool. So, yeah. Up the title. Um, Got a shiny green paint job too. It's very yeah, flashy. Yeah. Like metallic car bright green. <laughs> it, it's a nice change for all the machines being like dark blue, yeah. light green, light gray. <laughs> yeah, yep. choose choose my instruments for the aesthetics, <laughs> right? <laughs> I I always thought you know we should have come up with like a side hustle to uh, do, you know, custom decal and paint jobs on cytometers. Right. You know, I always wanted one with like flames on the side. We need to do that to our two auroras because we, we had two auroras yeah. now. So we have to name them differently. So we picked colors. So one's blue, one's green, but we have to, we should make them physically blue and green. Yeah. Yeah, there's something. <laughs> The last thing I wanted to talk about today was uh, the the Phytonex dyes. So I I understand that they were at Saito last year, uh, but uh, I wasn't there, and uh, so I just learned from that company this year uh, when they uh, gave a presentation uh, on the webinar at, that was hosted by University of Chicago. Um, Laura, you want to give the lowdown on? Those guys? I guess. Uh, I don't know if I know <laughs> enough of the technical detail details, um, but they make their fluorophores in a slightly different way. Um, I don't recall all the specifics, but they actually utilize oligonucleotides in the manufacturing of their fluorophores. Um, and so they're, I believe those are called phytons um, and it's sort of like a, a cross structure that has like each end of it has a spot to attach a fluorescent molecule. Um, so another part of their or another feature of these dyes um, is that they're sort of tunable brightness. Um, so you can have one fluorophore attached to the oligonucleotides, or you can have four fluorophores, which obviously will make the intensity much brighter. Um, and so they've come up with this different way to manufacture fluorophores and compared to the rest of the fluorophores on the market, they, um, I guess, they don't necessarily spill into as many detectors. 
Um, they tried to create some new fluorophores because there's not a lot of dyes available on the, it's the blue laser mainly. Um, mm -hmm. So they kind of focused on the blue laser and the yellow green laser um, because there aren't a ton of fluorophores in that um, emission wavelength. And so they've generated some new fluorophores in that range um, and some that are, the peak emission is comparable, like they have some that are comparable to PE Dazzle, let's say, in terms of peak emission. Um, but we know that PE Dazzle is one of my least favorite fluorophores because it spreads quite a bit due to the fact that it is excited by multiple lasers and it gets picked up by a bunch of different detectors, um, which just makes it kind of a pain when you're doing compensation or spectral um, unmixing. So their comparable dye, I forget the name of it, um, but they have one that peaks about the same point as PE Dazzle, for example, um, but it doesn't have that huge spreading issue. Um, so it, the emission is sort of more focused, I guess, in a sense, and it doesn't get excited by all of the lasers that PE Dazzle does. Um, and I think, I think that's, that's like a really key part um, that they were definitely trying to tackle is to try and get dyes that are excited by one emit, one excitation source, one laser line. Um, so yeah, so I think a lot of the stuff that you look at, uh, I mean, who would have who would have thought that all these dyes that we look at off of the yellow and red laser are also excited by the violet? I mean, you don't see that stuff until you start looking at aurora data, and you're like, why are there six humps in my emission spectra? But I think the focusing the absorption of these molecules to a very narrow one laser um, excitation is just going to clean things up pretty dramatically, I think. And that's even if you're just replacing things like Fitzy and PE and PE Dazzle, uh, but you're replacing with things that are equally bright, um, but don't have that cross laser excitation and therefore reduce spreading, you know, all around. Um, I, I think that's, that's, that's kind of been their, their hallmark thus far is, is touting this single laser excitation of their, of their floors. And I think, you know, we, we bought the conjugation kits. Uh, we have them now they're, they're delivered. Uh, we haven't tested anything yet, but, you know, I'm really looking forward to throwing those on the Aurora and seeing, you know, what, what, what we can actually do with them, you know, either by adding additional colors or replacing things that are kind of just causing a mess and spreading all over the place. Well, um, I had a user who was using some of it to do fret. And because of some of the characteristics that Laura was talking about, it really gave a very beautiful fret. It looked much better than it did on the other, uh, with the other floor combs that they were using. And so that was kind of nice. And I, I don't know if it's because it's the narrow band and all of those other things you were talking about, but yeah, it was very, very nice. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't do much fret. I, it's, you, you know, fret about fret? Ah, good one. Uh, <laughs> we need like a, a rim shot uh, button. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I'll get one for next time. <laughs> uh, the other thing I was going to say is, um, you know, you know, it's it's important to remember spread uh, is actually a function of spillover and intensity. So this idea of controlling the intensity is actually really important. I mean, if you could imagine all of your antibodies that had the fluorescence essentially tightered in to this narrow range of emission uh, intensity. That would be pretty much ideal to minimize spread because then you could put your things that are really abundant. It could be on a PE marker, but it's just the PE that has, you know, 25% uh, of the phyton filled with fluorophores. Or if you had something that was dimly expressed and you fill up the entire phyton with all the fluorophores and make it brighter. But if you're able to even out the intensity across lots of your markers, 
that would inherently just start controlling for spread all over the place and you'd have way better resolution. So, I mean, part of the problem is that, you know, with panel design, you have to spend so much time picking different floor for us for different markers that you want to look at. But um, I mean, if this could be designed to order and say, you know, I need X brightness on my CD8 and uh, Y brightness on my CD25 or something like that, that would be uh, pretty remarkable if, if that were, if that were possible. Um, so, I mean, I think, those two ideas, kind of the single laser excitation and the ability to tune the intensity, uh, seems really promising, and I'm I'm eager to see what's coming out. I know they're launching tomorrow, and uh, is it the 24th and 25th? They have um, the more one. webinars to launch a few more colors. Uh, so yeah, I mean it'll, it'll be interesting to see where this goes. I'm just kind of wondering who's going to buy them uh and uh you know so because they're they don't really have an antibody catalog right so i want these colors on all the antibodies right so you know i doubt that they're gonna ramp up their their antibodies um their antibody uh, catalog to outfit all these colors so you know who's going to license this or who's going to buy them outright and start putting it on all our favorite antibodies mm. that'll be good yeah i mean they do have the custom kits and it sounded like the conjugation was pretty straightforward protocol wise um but you know researchers are busy and it's hard to have that additional time the, the conjugation is never hard it's just time consuming it's, uh, it's just yeah and and also just the quality control of it too because you don't want to just conjugate it and throw it on your sample i mean you got to test it a little bit and that just adds more time and right. reactions and money so i think they did some comparison though and they said it was pretty reliable as far as you know one batch of conjugation to the second batch mm -hmm. of conjugation um but you know you probably have to i'd still want to test it <laughs> yeah yeah, especially if I were doing it, I would definitely want to test it. <laughs> they do, at least as a company, try to make things as easy for researchers as possible. Like they try to make the conjugation as straightforward as possible and minimize any sort of complicated steps. I remember they tested their um, stability of their dye. They left the antibody on the bench for 21 days and it still worked, hmm. assuming you keep it in the dark, obviously, yeah. um, but keeping it in the fridge versus um, just leaving it on the bench shop, it was stable, and that was kind of an interesting, I don't know how normal, like PE size 7, does that last on the bench for 21 days? <laughs> Probably not. Um, we always have those people who are like, oh shoot, I accidentally left the vial of antibody out overnight. Is it still okay? Um, and then I think they do have a, an additional buffer that you need to add, like the Brilliant Violets have the Brilliant Violet staining buffer that needs to be added. I think they, um, the Phytonex dyes also have. The other sub kind of, and I, I don't know if that's added at the time of staining or if that is part of the conjugation process, but there is this like stop reaction buffer or something like that that you had in the end. I don't know. I haven't done it yet. So I just know I got like a couple of uh, reagents that need to be frozen and uh, the dyes that were kept at four degrees and, you know, you, you mix them together for some amount of time with your antibody and then conjugate them. So, but there's some kind of quenching process, I think, at the end of the conjugation process. But I don't know if that carries through to staining. Right. I thought they were talking about a, a buffer similar to the brilliant violet stain buffer where you have to like mix something in when you're staining, but yeah, it could be. Wrong. I like the idea of having a series of dyes that if, I mean, if they pick up, like it would change the way you would think about what you need on the, when you buy a new 
instrument. Because currently, for example, your my, my blue lasers on most of the machines have a detector for size scatter, one for FITSI and one for for CP sci five point five, and that's about it. And so for a, a laser, that's what twelve thousand dollars. It's it's not a whole lot of usage. It's not money best spent. So it's it's kind of nice to have way more. Uh, tools to play with with this particular laser and that might change like the need to buy uv lasers might go away be if you can uh, utilize those those dyes a little bit better that was a great point i just made there it was it you. was you know show stopping <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're running out of stuff to say, so I don't know if you wanted to talk about anything else. Maybe uh, it seems that BD and Cytex stopped fighting. <laughs> I was just gonna say that, um, again, I don't know, I'm not a chemist that makes fluorophores, but I don't know how the Phionex dyes will translate into the additional lasers, like on the Bigfoot and the Sony. Oh, right. Like, will they be able to make fluorophores that will fit into these slots now that there are instruments that have all these additional lasers and additional detectors? And right now we're wondering why do these exist? Because there currently are not any products that fit into these spaces, but maybe Phytonex is the one that's going to generate the products that fits in there. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I know, well, you know, if you follow Mike Stadnitsky, um on any social medias, uh, he makes some pretty bold claims about where they're at and where they're headed, especially kind of how, how frequently and how many dyes they're going to be releasing. Um, I mean, he, he's, of course, you know, it's his company, so he ought to be pretty uh, bullish on it. But I mean, I, I don't doubt them, um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's got to be lots of stuff in their pipeline because they have a very aggressive rollout of these dyes, you know, over the next year or so. Um, and who knows where they're going to end up? I think they're kind of tackling one laser at a one laser line at a time, just to showcase some of these uh, different the variety of dyes, but. Um, you know, whether or not they jump up to the IR range or the DPV or what, you know, is to be seen. But I think, you know, in, in any case, um, you know, cleaning things up across lasers, if you're able to do that with a handful of dyes, I mean, that just makes your whole panel better. So, you know, you have a bunch of the, the go-tos that you're used to using already, and then you throw in a few of these to clean up spillover. I mean, you make your whole panel better. Mm -hmm. All right. Nobody wants to talk about SciTech and BD? <laughs> I don't know anything. <laughs> I just follow uh, Paul Robinson and his little tweets and whatnot about the issues every once in a while. He's always interesting. Yeah. I had a joke about it, but now I'm not. <laughs> oh, come on. Now you got to tell us. No, no. <laughs> well, I'll, uh, I'll let you all go. Thank you. Well, thanks for setting for, us up, David. Yes. You did a good, yeah, thank you for setting all of this up. Well, thank you. It was fun. Yeah. We'll do we, it should call it we should call it nerd chat, though. Nerd chat. <laughs> There's a little tune. There's a little bit of that going on, you know. <laughs> we just need to get Laura some glasses. <laughs> yeah. I think I can take one somewhere. Yeah, there you go. And I had a couple of wigs I was thinking about just cutting out and then coming back as like with long black hair. <laughs> that would be awesome. So right. next time I'll be someone else. <laughs> can have a costume change halfway That's through. <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia yep. Sims, Laura Johnson, Ryan Duggan. And uh, we'll see you next week. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.